as I introduce to you, we have uh, Paula Beer, who's now Paula Beer Mole Queen. Do you want to say hello? Hi. <laughs> Mrs. Mole Queen is a nurse who has helped people both here in the United States and also in Haiti, and has many good stories to tell. We have, um, from the class of OO of Ott, we have Sergeant First Class Glenn Robertson. The Sergeant is a distinguished musician whose music touches many, many people as he serves our country. And from the class of 1999, we have Lauren Hurl Martins, who is a scientist, as many of you want to be, and uh, is doing research into medicines and treatments that could potentially cure diseases that we all worry about. So each of them is super distinguished, Right now, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Hahi, who has certificates to give them. And then we will have our state representatives who have citations to give them. Let me know when you're ready. Sure. Uh, I promise I'll be quick. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as Ms. York mentioned uh, at the outset, this program is a very important program to David Prouty in the history of uh, this district. Many students like yourselves have the opportunity to pay it forward once they cross the podium and go out into the world. Whether it be in college, career, or life, our alumni contribute a great deal to the community at large. And many of you sitting here today do that right now and have been doing that over the last two years of the pandemic, learning in a multitude of ways. Whether it be remote, hybrid, in person, you've adjusted your sales no matter what the challenge. And the people that are about to speak to you today have done that their whole lives. Regardless of what they've had to confront or meet in their lives for challenges, they've embraced them as opportunities to learn. Life is a journey. It's one where you get a chance to learn each and every day, not just in the classroom, anywhere and everywhere you go. So as they tell you their stories today and we honor them, realize that this could be you in the years ahead and that you have just as much, if not more, to contribute as they have. With that, I'd like to award them the certificates with Ms. York. Thank you so much for your service and everything you've done in the community at large and across the, you know, not just the United States, but the world, and uh, for demonstrating such proudy pride, because that's what it's all about, and exemplifying proudy pride. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize Paula Beer McQueen of the class of 1980. Thank you. Next, I'd like to recognize Glenn Robertson. And finally, Lauren Pearl Martins of the class of 1999. Thank you. Once again, please pay them the respect and honor that they so rightly deserve and hear their stories intently. Uh, because, believe it or not, they've got a heck of a story to tell, each and every one of them. So, thank you so much for being with us today and for representing Prouty so well. At this time, I'd like to ask our state representatives, Mr. Berthium and Mr. Durant, to come up to the lectern and Give their citations. Uh, I, I just want to um, I want to congratulate uh, the recipients this year. 
1980, good, so I don't feel too bad at 82, so that's nice. Um, but you know, you know, you look at, at, at what they've done and you look at the wall that has all of these alum on there, um, and it's something to be proud of, right? When you wanna, you, you guys are kinda young still, but when you get to our old ripe age, um, you want to look back a little bit, and you want to look back and, and, and see what, what kind of impact you've made and, and what you've been able to do um, and, and how you might be remembered. And, and you guys, you all have done such a fantastic job um, of, of going out into the world and really making a difference. So we're here to say congratulations for all that you've done and to, um, and to hopefully inspire everybody um, to go out there and make your way and, and be the best that you can be. So congratulations. I would just say, when I was here, I definitely got a detention in this room, at least one, at least one. And I would say, class of 84 beats 82 anytime. Um, but I would agree with Peter and Dr. Hahi that you don't intend to do this when you go here to school, right? You come here, you go to school, and um, the values and, and things that teachers taught you here, it, it eventually leads to this. I mean, we have two of my favorite top five teachers here today, Mr. O'Leary and Mr. Latola. How about a big hand for those two? So we would just, can you, can you three come up? So now we get to the best part. I would like to first introduce to you Paula Beer Moqueen. Thank you. It is an honor to receive this award and to be back at David Prouty. It certainly seems just like yesterday not 42 years, that I was sitting in this auditorium and Mr. Hurley was teaching my classmates and myself how to sing the school song. And Mrs. Olson was saying to me, is that gum I see in your mouth, Miss Beer? Um, I would like to thank um, the principal for highlighting my career and educational path. When I was thinking about my days at Prouty, the education that I received and the skills I gained and what aided me most in my uh, post-grad and adult life and helped me to build my career path, I came up with five lessons that I used and still use over and over again. Now I have to admit, these lessons, they didn't come from books. But I did get a solid academic education in this building. All of these lessons were taught to me by teachers and an administrator. The first two lessons were taught to be by Mr. Latola. Now I'm sure he doesn't remember any of this, but they impacted my life tremendously. Lesson one, he had given me um, an assignment. I was in his, uh, a freshman, I was in his earth science class and he gave me an assignment to draw a map from the high school to home. And now I thought I had just scored the biggest win. I lived on Paxton Road. <laughs> How hard can it be? And uh, he then charged me with putting in a few things about earth science and he said I could add a few things that were important to me. So I set to work on the project and I, um, for the requirement of the earth science, I labeled Main Street, I labeled Paxton Road, done. Um, and for what was important to me, I labeled the Dairy Queen, uh, the Bowling Alley in my home. I think I may have colored it a little and I proudly turned that in and then I waited the two or three days to get the project back. Well. I did get the project back, and I quickly flipped it over to see the grade, and there was no grade. There was nothing, except a statement is lesson number one. 
the statement said do this over in this time open your eyes look around and be an observer I was shocked what had I missed so when walking home that day we all walked I kind of said, you know, I can't believe this. I got the road, I got the sign, I got this, I got that. Well, I realized I hadn't even labeled north, south, east, or west. It was environmental science, or earth science. I should have done that. I missed Lake Whittemore. <laughs> Who misses Lake Whittemore? It's right there. When you're walking up Paxton Road, you had a beautiful view of it. Totally missed it. Also walking up Paxton Road, there are these gorgeous old oak trees. And if that doesn't say earth science, what does? totally didn't put it on. And from my personal things that I missed, and he kind of was shocked I missed this, I did not put one of my friend's homes on that map. Now we were neighborhoods then. We, we all knew each other, we all walked to school together, we walked home again. I totally took that all for granted, never even put it down. I also never put down the home of my very best friend, who I am still very best friends with today. So the lesson of opening your eyes, look around, and observed has served me so well. I often, um, and I often use this lesson over and over again. The simple act of opening my eyes, looking around, and observing has served me well. Now, lesson number two also goes to Mr. Latola. Um, and this is probably the most important lesson I learned at David Prouty. I was a little older at this time, maybe a junior or a senior, and I was running for something. I was always running for something. Some office, wanted to represent my school here, do something. I was doing it. And all the student speeches were done, our platforms were presented, what we represented, what we wanted to do. And all of a sudden, it was getting down to crunch time. We were getting ready for the vote. And I had this overwhelming feeling that I'm going to lose. This one, I don't have. And I was getting anxious and upset and happened to run into Mr. Latola. And as only Mr. Latola can do, he gave me, what's the matter with you? And um, so I told him, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to lose. Now at that point, many kind adults would have said to me, you know, Paula, it's OK. There'll be next time. Let's not worry about it. Have a cookie you know, relax, you know, you'll be fine, but not Mr. Latola. Um, he looked at me and he told me, with just enough authority and attitude to learn to fail and to do it graciously. He informed me that life, and it was like a wake up call, and he told me, life isn't fair and that I certainly wouldn't win them all. Well, since my post high school days, I have won a lot, I have achieved a lot, and I have failed a lot. But learning to fail and doing it with humility, grace, understanding is a lesson that was taught to me right here in this building by a teacher that I have used constantly. Building a medical clinic in Haiti, I would go one step forward and achieve and achieve, then I would lose and fail 10 step backs and back and I would do it again. I did this for 10 years and it hadn't been for learning the skill of learning to fail, I would not have achieved. Lesson number three. Lesson number three was talk, taught to me by Dr. Hicks. Um, and I'm sure he also doesn't remember this. But when I was about a sophomore junior in that area, I had the privilege of caring for Dr. Hicks' children, basically babysitting. So on the first Friday night that I had agreed to babysit for Dr. Hicks, um, I went over to his house and I figured, you know, how hard could this be? I would show up, play with the kids, put them to bed, raid his refrigerator, listen to his music, use his phone, no problem, piece of cake, I've got this. And I thought I did until Dr. Hicks looked at me and said the dreaded word, you are now responsible for the lives of my children until I walk in this door. Using the word responsible almost knocked me over. What a wake up moment for a 16 year old. Me, responsible? 
I looked down at the adorable little boy and the baby he put in my arms, this little girl, and I said, oh wow, I'm an adult. I'm in charge of their safety and their well-being. I'm the responsible one. As soon as he walked out the door, I immediately grabbed the phone, called Ann Gobi, now Senator Gobi, told herself to get over here that Dr. Hicks just informed me that I was responsible. <laughs> I learned a great lesson that Friday night and at times over the years have had to remind myself of that lesson. If you sign up for it, if you get involved with it, if you agree to do it, whatever the situation, you must be responsible for it. A great lesson to learn. Lesson number four and five, um, they go together. They were taught to me by a, um, a teacher, a teacher I didn't have the privilege of having, but I had him as a homeroom teacher, and that was Mr. Crosby. Um, do they still do homeroom? Homeroom teachers, I give the hats off to all of you if you still do it. You see the kids in the morning when they're tired, tired and cranky, then you get the pleasure of seeing us six hours later when we're tired and miserable. So um, Mr. Crosby um, was my homeroom teacher, and um, I didn't have him for math or physics, but it was our senior year, it was getting down to graduation time, and I, a classmate and I, we had a problem that we had been sitting on for a month or two that we had to get done because we had to turn it in to graduate. So of course we didn't do it, and we waited to the last day that it was due in, and we decided to show up early for homeroom, and that we would just hammer this project out, turn it in, we'd be good to go. So we showed up at the same time Mr. Crosby showed up. He went up, sat at his, at his desk, and enjoyed his coffee. And my friend and I um, immediately started whining, and then we complained. The problem was too hard. We didn't get enough time to do it. After all, it was only a month. Um, we didn't have the internet then. We only had one book. We couldn't find the answer in the book. Um, and this, this went on for 20 minutes. Finally, Mr. Crosby stood up and walked over to us and he said, stop the insanity. He said, I know you feel better for about a minute with complaining, so I gave you the minute. We're now on minute 20, and you still have the problem in front of you, and you've done nothing. So we kind of looked at him as if to say, well, what do we do? And lesson number five goes right into this. Um, he looked at us and he said, I am standing right here, ask for help. And it was like the light bulb went on. Oh, ask for help? Mr. Crosby explained, you know, I'm right here. Had you asked for help, we could have had this done. He walked up to the blackboard and he said, okay, Paula, tell me what you know. I said, okay, A equals this. My classmate said, B equals this. The only thing we didn't know was what C was. And with Mr. Crosby helping us, C was figured out in about 30 seconds. He said, you two could have gone out for coffee, had breakfast, and been back here before the time was up. But instead, we chose to whine, sit there, and not ask for help. I have used lesson four and five so often in my career. The last two years as a nurse during the pandemic, um, a lot of whining and complaining started to happen, and of course, certainly didn't help. But what did help is when all of us in the medical field started asking each other for help. And not only the nurses and nurses and doctors and doctors, we started pulling in our maintenance team, our unit secretaries, our housekeepers, our security staff, all of us together, when asked to help, that is the only way we survived this pandemic in the past couple of years. So in review, I will repeat the lessons that I took from David Prouty that helped me most in my career path and in life so far. One, open your eyes, be an observer. Two, learn to fail and do it with grace and dignity. Three, be responsible and be responsible for everything you do. Four, stop whining, stop complaining. Well, you can whine for maybe a minute. <laughs> then stop complaining. And number five, ask for help, for people are truly kind and willing to help. Now, I would like to offer my thoughts. Maybe it'll be lesson six for somebody, but 
moving forward in your life, if you can look for, find, create, choose, and add joy to your life, whether you're a teenager in your 20s, 30s, 40s, it doesn't matter what stage you are in life, what place, place you are in life, creating, finding, and choosing joy will make all the difference and tremendously add to your life. 42 years has gone by in a blink of an eye, in a flash. I wish all of you a life full of great moments with great joy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was an excellent, excellent speech. Thank you. We're very, very lucky to have you here today, Mrs. Mulqueen. Thank you. Our next speaker and our next distinguished alumnus is Sergeant First Class Glenn Robertson of the U.S. Army and also of the David Prouty Class of 2000. First, I'd like to thank uh, the committee for honoring me with this. I'd like to thank Mr. Hahi, uh, Principal York, let's say I got a few others here, Mr. Berthew, Mr. Durant, um, state representatives, thank you so much. Uh, getting the call that this was gonna happen was, a, was really an honor, oh, it was, uh, yeah, Miss Brainy, thanks so much. So, uh, you know, and then it got delayed and it didn't happen and we were kind of wondering if it was gonna work out, but it did, so here we are. And it's such an honor to be back in Spencer. Um, I love it here. I still call the Worcester area Spencer my home. Even driving up with my two kids in the car, be like, God, oh, when are we gonna get there? It's taking forever. I'd be like, guys, we're gonna be home in like four or five hours. And then my wife would go, yeah, you don't live here. That's not your home. You live in Annapolis now. And I'm like, no, Spencer's still my home. I, I love it here. This is my place. I've ridden my bike around here, the Dairy Queen. Those are the, those are the things, that, it's where my heart lies. So with that being said, um, you know, it's an interesting path to how I ended up kind of where I am. And a lot of that I attribute to the community of individuals from this area. Uh, Mr. Hurl, big influence on me. The teachers here at Prouty, huge influence. My parents here, uh, Postman Jerry and my mom Janet, huge influences. Uh, I, I worked at Country Spirits when I lived in town. Uh, out of town, all these people kind of instill work ethic and values that I, I still employ today as I move through and do the things that I do. Um, so I want to I want to thank them. I also want to thank these two incredible women that I am uh, up here receiving this honor with. One, uh, your incredible work in nursing, and then a doctor. And I had to write this down uh, in the field of neurodegeneration and deterioration of the brain. That's pretty heavy when you consider that I built all my success off of hitting things with sticks. So <laughs> thank you for the, uh, I, yeah, thank you for the honor of bringing me up here. So, but with that being said, you know, it made me think, well, why did I get selected for this when I am up with such amazing people and their contributions to society? And as I think about that, it made me reflect deeper into what it is that I do. So I'll just go back a little bit. I was educated here at Prouty. I spent a lot of time focusing on music in the arts. I spent a lot of time in this room. So earlier as we walked around the school, I was like, I, you know, I don't really remember where the library even is anymore, but the auditorium, the band room, the, the practice fields, the football field, that's where I spent a lot of my time. And that's where I, I, you know, gained a lot of my experience. And, um, you know, I, I came to Prouty and I knew I wanted to be in the bands. And I did that. And I knew after Prouty I wanted to go to UMass. And guess what I wanted to do? I wanted to be in bands. I wanted to be in the march band. I wanted to play drums. It was like, I was very one-track minded. And at some point, somebody at UMass was like, hey, pal, you're here to get a degree. The drums are kind of, you know, that's great and all, but you need to get a degree. So I said, fine, I get a degree in arts. Graduated from UMass with my bachelor's degree after a solid five years. And I moved to New York City to pursue the same thing. And it was great, and I enjoyed it. 
Um, and eventually, I realized that I had to do something else. I, I needed to do something else because the music wasn't working out as well as I wanted it to. So I started searching and searching, and I started applying for groups like the Blue Man Group, or jobs out in Las Vegas, or I was looking at Disney. I wanted to go play drums at Disney, wherever I could find. And unbelievably, a guy reached out to me that holds the job that I currently hold, also a UMass graduate, and said, hey, I'm gonna leave the Army. I play drums for the Army. Are you interested in doing that? And I was like, yeah, that's all I wanna do. I just wanna, I wanna play music. So I decided, what the hell, I'm gonna give this a go. I took this big risk. I had no idea what I was getting into. I think I freaked my family out because they didn't understand what the military was. They were not exactly from a military family. And I went, went to basic training. And it was an eye opener. I went to basic training at 27. I wasn't young. And I was with a lot of people 18 years old. A lot of people there in great shape, ready, running and gunning. And then there's me, 27, completely freaked out. But I'll tell you what I learned instantly and which is one of the biggest values that I can come all the way back to Prouty and all of my education all the way up. The first thing that you learn in the Army is that it's a team. And what I figured out really quick is that teamwork is something that I value so incredibly. And when I got that back in to my life, even just at the earliest level as being in the Army at basic training, it added so much value. And it was so great to hear um, Mrs. Mulqueen talk about teamwork as it pertained to COVID and what they realized is you probably had all these different facets of your industry kind of working independently but what really made things start to click is when you came back together as a team. So as you move forward one of the biggest things that's a takeaway for me is always want to be a member of a team. Be a team player. Being an individual has its time and it has its place. But being on a team adds a tremendous amount of value to your personal self, and it adds a tremendous amount of value to whatever you're trying to put out. Um, you know, and, sorry, my phone continues to close. It's where all my notes are. So, you know, that's, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of this for me was service. I get to serve my country, and I didn't know that that was something that I wanted to do. I didn't understand it. Matter of fact, when I was here at Prouty, and I saw the recruiters set up in the hallway by the cafeteria, I would do everything. I'd come through this door, I'd go around the long way. I did not want to talk to recruiters. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't something I wanted to do. It wasn't something I wanted to understand. And quite frankly, I thought they were threatening. I thought if you even talked to them, it meant you were signing up. And that's a big regret of mine, because I didn't understand back then that the, the military in general is a great place for careers. And the Army itself has over 160 careers. They're not just things to do, they're not just jobs, but we are career focused. We have doctors, we have dentists, we have HR professionals, we have computer graphics, we have musicians. It's this unbelievable place. So what I, while I'm not a recruiter, and I don't want to push anything on you, what I would recommend is at least explore it and have a conversation. And the best part about things today is you don't even have to talk to a recruiter, you can just explore it online. Um, so that, that's my soft army pitch. And there's great educational benefits, but you need to do what's right for you. Just keep it um, as maybe a potential option. Um, I also want to speak about the music and arts, because, you know, a, as we all know, it's something that sometimes ends up on the chopping block. It's, you know, maybe it's not valued enough because it's this intangible thing. And through my experience, since I've been a musician a long time and I've entertained a lot of people, I've kind of been able to wrap my head around what it is that music does. And for me, what I see music doing is that music can turn down all the noise. And what I mean by that, it's all the extra noise that's going on in the world, whether it's, uh, whether it's in the news, whether it's political divide or ideological divides that happen in this country, I have been able to watch groups of people like yourself come together in a room and celebrate in a common entity, and that is music and art. And there's a tremendous value in that. Um, it, you know, and I don't think that we can always put a word to why it's so important, 
But for me, that's what I'm seeing, and especially nowadays, it has the ability to bring people together. So I would encourage you that as you move forward, you support the arts, you support music in whatever endeavor you're on. And if you have friends that are in music and the arts, support them, encourage them, go to their shows and pay the cover because for God's sakes, we need the money. We're musicians, all right? Stop trying to get on the guest list. So, so I'm, I'm honored to be here. It's a pleasure to get to speak with you all. And you know, the, the last thing I'll leave you with is education is a huge thing. And, and what I believe that education affords you is the ability to take risks as you move through life. The more education that you have, the more that you can look at your, your left and your right peripherals, you can make an educated decision on what's going to be right for you. And that's the type of stuff that allows you to take risks as you go forward and do something as crazy as joining the Army at 27 years old. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I'm very honored to be here. And uh, go Panthers. It's my great honor to introduce our third speaker for the morning, Lauren Hurl Martins from the class of 1999. Thanks everybody. Um, I'm honored and humbled to receive the recognition today. There are so many Prouty grads that I know, people sitting in this room, friends of mine that have done more impactful things in the world than I feel like I have. So I think to get a chance to explain that to you, also when I think back about it, it reminds me of who I was when I entered this school at the age 14. And it was brace face, frizzy hair. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And it was the faculty and the coaches and the staff that were here that really shaped my life and helped me to define myself as a neuroscientist. Holy cow. <laughs> um, and if you had told me that as I was sitting in the audience today, I would have been like, you are nuts. And part of that reason is because I lacked the belief in myself that I could do that. And looking back on it, people knew that about me. And I was like, really? Like, conversations today, even when we meet people, it's like, oh yeah, that's Lauren. Like, Lauren does the science thing. She does it really well. And I'm like, oh, you saw that I could do that? That's crazy. And so I think the messaging that I have is I completely scrapped my speech in the shower this morning because procrastination and overthinking things is also something that has carried with me since I was 14. Um, I thank you all for giving me the chance and time to speak with you today. So I'm just like, what are the things that were impactful that I didn't realize about myself when I was in high school that I would like to just maybe make a light bulb go off in one of your heads today to be like, oh yeah, I have that. So who is Dr. Lauren Hurl Martens, PhD. I'm a scientist in your eyes, a neuroscientist to the broader scientific community, a microglial and neuroinflammation biologist to my peers. There are actually very few jobs that I'm qualified to do in the world, and that freaks me out. Um, I work in the biotech field, which is very volatile. Companies come and go, pharma companies scoop things up, spit things out, that's how it works. And when I, I've lost a job, not on my credentials, but literally there was zero funding and we were done. And when I opened the wanted ads to see what I was qualified for, there was zero jobs available. How could this be? I'm a highly educated individual. I feel like I have charisma, I have personal skills. So how can I find a way to really identify what are the criteria that make me more than just a neuroscientist and actually impactful on the world? And Glenn stole my first one, which is being part of a team. So at Prouty, I was on the field hockey team. I was a track um, runner. I was on student council. And those were just places in the community where I found a home and surrounded myself with people that I learned from every day. And then I realized, you have to kind of define where you stand on the team. I'm not the innovator. I, know, I don't bring the ideas to the table. Um, I'm not the loudest one in the room, totally an introvert. We can say I'm an extroverted introvert, but I'm an introvert. So how, how, do I, how do I get these people to work together? And I was like, oh, I'm the facilitator. I'm the person that can bring 
the person over here that's the sports jock and the band player and the scientific nerd and the person that really doesn't want to be here today together and be like, guys, we have to solve this problem and we have X amount of time to do it. And then they all stare at you like you have foreheads and I'm like, no, really, it's true. And let's, let's all talk to each other and figure out how to do it. And so, and the same thing with being on a sports team. I was not the best player. I was not the fastest. I had a whole lot of heart and passion and I just wanted us all to get along and to win and do something together. So again, really bringing to the team together and like saying, let's work on this, let's do that. And like driving for success, that was me. Not really sure where it all came from, but that was where I stood. So being part of a team and learning to interact with people is huge. As Glenn said, having a job. I worked at Big Video, which we don't even, you guys don't even know what VHS cassettes are anymore, but Big Video was in the Fair Plaza and I checked videos out four days a week and having to project manage and time manage my time around that and having to work with all different people and customers was, helps me figure out how to interact with people and be part of a team. Um, and so where does that fit into what I do today? I lead cross-functional groups. So I do this really very early part of drug discovery that's so niche and so small and it's the early part. And to take that idea and those things that I work on and modeling disease and how they get to the clinic to help people someday, that's like a 15 year road with a whole lot of roadblocks set up in it. And so I lead a team right now that we're looking to find a drug to treat um, neurodegenerative disease and inflammation in the brain. And when I walk into that room, I'm the only person that knows how to do that. And then they're all here to help me and say, the clinicians say, this is how we have to, what we can find in the clinic. The people that manufacture the drugs say, this takes this amount of time and I need these starting materials. I work with chemists, biologists, clinicians, manufacturing, and some really smart people that all come to the table and listen to me. And so I think how, knowing how to interact with those people is just huge and I, it's something that you should all be proud of because I know it's inside of you. The next thing is mentorship. And mentorship is something that I never knew I really needed until I, someone used the word. And um, when you look back on it, it's, mentorship is a very broad spectrum. There's a person that will sit with you, you can meet with them on a weekly, daily basis and they can help you drive your career forward. And then there's the one person that makes one single comment that will literally change the path in your life and you're just willing to take that feedback. And so examples for that are, um, I think, you know, Mr. Latola is getting a lot of props today. Um, Cross was huge. The math and science department, um, Mr. Bouchard in biology here, they took me under their wing and they were just like, you do this well, you can do this, like we can walk you through this. And you should take this class. You should think about taking this class. You should think about taking this class. And I think, and looking back as a female scientist and seeing that many of my mentors are men, is just huge props to the world as it is for seeing that in self-conscious people out there. And so going back to those, you know, being pushed and mentored, these are the things you should do. Coaches that mentored me. I never thought I should run a certain race. I never thought I should be on the track team. I went to states like three out of four years that I was here, which was crazy due to Mr. Butterfield. And then also knowing that he sat at home with his wife every night, Mrs. Butterfield, and she would say, yeah, Lauren should never go into literature and interpret poetry. And she told me that with my grades very easily. <laughs> um, so I think just you know, kn knowing and driving and shaping that and having people stand behind you and give you some direction but not tell you how to do it is huge. Um, and then the one person that literally changed the course of my career was um, I was a biology major at undergrad, went to undergrad saying, okay, I like science. Again, still not knowing what I would do five years from now. I've never had a five-year plan. Um, I took an ecology class. I really thought I would be a field scientist, mainly because that's all I could envision in my head. Um, and I went on a, an adventure, they call it, and we went to St. Thomas for 10 days, which is an ecological disaster. And we had to take, we had to have a project while we were there. Well, you would observe something and come back with kind of build a hypothesis and answer the question. Um, I chose to watch lizards for 10 days. I will never do that again, ever. <laughs> um, I was not, I'm not up for the heat, the muck, and staring at things for long hours. 
And he's and the professor was like, Lauren, it was a lot of fun having you on the trip. We had a lot of we had a lot of rum punch and you, you know these great things. You learned a lot about yourself. You should never be an ecologist. And I was like, Yeah, I know. And what do I do? And he was like, There's this thing called genetic sequencing, molecular biology, new technologies that are coming on. Read this book. And he handed me a novel about how this human genome was sequenced. And I was like, I don't read books like that. Like, that, that's not me. And he's like, just trust me. And it was the book that changed my life. And I immediately then, for the next, for junior and senior year, just took every molecular biology class, learned how, what cell culture was. Like, you can grow cells in a dish and you can do things to them. That was, it blew my mind. I didn't know that. And so I think, you know, that one person really changed the trajectory of my career. And um, that feedback was, you know, sometimes hard to hear, but also it's like that's really what drives you. And so, and then I would just, the last on mentorship is then along the way in going through a PhD, you find the people that you learn from every day. Some are mentors and some are your critics, but they're all your mentors because the critics also point out things in you that you need to change to be enveloped in this whole society as a whole. So take that feedback too. And you can kind of like query it along the way and say, see how relevant it is. But sometimes it's actually just really useful to say, that's not a great trait about myself and I should work on that. And then here are the good things and things that I should drive forward. And I've had many female mentors, strong female mentors in the sciences, <coughs> working moms, you can do both, you can be successful. Um, and so those are people that I have seen when I get a job, I'm like, who do I, who do I connect with? Who do I want to be like? And finding those people and asking them, asking them questions, <coughs> asking for help, and really just taking that time to learn about yourself and learn about them and figure out what are the things that I want to be like. Um, and so the last thing is trust in yourself. So I told you how niche my experience is, and so then I broaden it with my soft skills. But sometimes there's a pro to my niche too. And when I went out into the world, there were all these great things happening. I was overwhelmed by the amount of science. I'm not super, I'm not a genius. It doesn't click with me like that. You have to explain it to me like three times. And then when I get it, I get really excited about it and I get on board. So then I knew to myself, how do I differentiate myself from the rest of these people so that when it comes to hiring, when we both look the same on paper, why would they choose me? And so it is those soft skills, but it's also how I made myself niche. So in neuroscience, you think of the brain, you think of neurons, you think of how they're connected. And that is what 95% of people studied, even when I was getting my PhD. And then there was this thing with inflammation and how the body works and it, your brain is different. And there was just kind of this new findings that cells in the brain actually are, they have play an immune role. And this was like taboo to like all the people on my thesis committee. Men would show up, and they were all men, would show up at my thesis committee and they were like, Lauren, why are you doing this? Why do you care about these cells? And I'm like, well, they have to be important. And this is what I chose, right? This is my, how I'm gonna test the hypothesis and prove that it matters. And so I think that proving them wrong and also educating them, proving them wrong is a strong statement. But, I, I, but I, I'm proud of myself for that. But also I educated them, I was like, this matters. And now there is a huge exploding field of science about how neurons talk to these innate immune cells in the brain and how those immune cells keep the neurons in check and they really drive some of the disease biology. And so that's where I differentiated myself. I, followed, I took a chance and followed that path. And so it was like, and then suddenly science realized we need to hire people that know how to study this. And I was like, oh, that's me, I can do that. And then I had all of these other skills, soft skills, to bring, educate people and bring them along with me, and also being able to w hear their sides and being able to incorporate that all together. So trust your gut. You don't have to take the path that everyone else takes. Just you know yourself, trust in yourself, and know that you can, there always is something to fall back on, and you can fail. You can be wrong. It's okay. And you will take that learning and move on from it. And so I'll just finish with, be happy, enjoy your career, enjoy your choices. If you're not enjoying it, there are many other things you can do. You can dig deep and find new skills that can help you completely do a career change. I know I'm in awe of the people and my friends that do it, and they make their life work in that way, and they just, you spend more time at your job than you do with your family. And so 
be happy doing it, and if you're not, just change. So thanks. Can we have another round of applause for all of our honorees? Does anyone have um, any questions? We have time for two or three questions if you, anyone has one that everyone would benefit from. I know that I, I am curious to know about maybe your favorite Prouty memory. Would each of you be willing to share? Good morning again. <laughs> Thank you. My favorite Prouty memory, you know, uh, it, it's hard because I have so many great memories here. Um, but I, I think that some of my, my favorite memories were the times that uh, it was like a homecoming or something, and as a school community, everybody really took pride in the school, and you know whether it was decorating the halls or trying to do something special, or if it was at the um, like the the pep rallies or whatever. Those are the times that I thought were the most special because while everybody's kind of doing their own thing and everybody's scrambling around those times where everybody came together, all the classes, and, and you realize that you're one community of Panthers, those are kind of the moments that I appreciated the most. Um, well, kind of on the same theme, I think, and this is actually gonna be a confession, I think the it's over the seven year mark, so I won't get charged with anything. Um, but back in the uh, 80s, it's the late 70s and 80s, it was customary that the graduating class paint the year they graduated on the, um, in the parking lot. And of course, we were told not to do that. And I may or may not have been involved in getting the police department to come down and set up the lights for us to do it, telling them I had permission. And um, it actually worked. Uh, 1980 stayed across the, um, the parking lot for the traditional year to 1981 did it. Um, the only thing with us is somewhere along the line, someone called from the police station to say, yeah, they don't have permission to do that. And the lights went off and all of a sudden you see uh, all of us ran, and the next morning you see all of our pink footsteps all through the, the 1980, but it was a fun memory. Thank you. I think I'd also agree just when the, the homecoming and bringing the whole school coming together, it's not really something you experience again ever with so many people being excited about one thing and united together. So it's not something else that I experience on a regular day. And I think just that energy that comes from it is amazing. We have one more citation for our honorees. This is from Senator Gobi. And as I pass this out, if anyone has actual questions that you wanted to come up and ask, you certainly. Oh, Caden? Uh, yeah. Uh, have you actually used calculus? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the doctor says no. doesn't involve integrals, but I'm seriously lacking in wish I could code, so still learn how to do it. <laughs> 